you very much for having us here today. You guys in Maryland get up really, really early. We don't do that in Ohio unless our livestock are on fire. <laughs> Which doesn't happen very often. Well, we're here today, as Josh said, to tell you a story. Uh, it's a story that is equal parts patriotism, perseverance, and pure dumb luck, emphasis on pure dumb luck. In the process of telling you that story, and hopefully giving you a few chuckles, we will talk to you about a generation of brave Americans who have never been properly recognized nor appropriately thanked for their service and sacrifice. Your main speaker, Mike Jackson, is working tirelessly to change that. We will also be introducing you to an exciting new organization called the American Veterans Institute that is dedicated to making certain that America never forgets who its GIs really are and how they have enriched our society. Now, Mike, the guy uh, that I just mentioned, is the guy who was, as the book title indicates, naked in Da Nang. And yes, it was not a metaphor. He really was naked in Da Nang. And uh, it was not pretty, but it was very clean in every possible sense of the word. Um, and I am overjoyed, really overjoyed, to tell you that he is here today fully clothed. <laughs> And assuming you guys are appropriately responsive, I think he'll stay that way. Normally, he just starts removing articles of clothing if he needs a laugh. So uh, make sure you give him plenty. Now, aside from his occasional lapses into nudity, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Jackson is a decorated combat pilot with over 210 missions over Vietnam and 23 years as an Air Force officer. He has a master's in business and a very successful 13-year run as executive director of the National Aviation Hall of Fame. He also appears in seasons three and four of Legends of Air Power, and he was recently named Distinguished Alumni for 2005 for his alma mater, Webster University, and that was for service to society. And I'm not sure what that service was. I think it was probably staying clothed. As of seven months ago, he added a new title to that roster, and that is National Chairman for Operation Welcome Home, which we will tell you more about shortly. Now, when I joined Mike in this book project four years ago, I did so because I believed that his stories and his emotional integrity and his amazing sense of humor would really help America better appreciate the true legacy of its Vietnam veterans. And contrary to the portrayals by Oliver Stone and the popular media, these guys are genuine heroes. And they are heroes just as much as the World War II generation is, just as much as the guys who went to Korea are, and just as those serving in Iraq and Afghanistan today are. And uh, it's time we let them know that. And I am very proud to say that Mike Jackson's book is having an impact. It is changing the way America views its Vietnam veterans. And Operation Welcome Home this November is going to enhance that effort. Uh, the American Veterans Institute will then complete the circle. I am always proud to know him, and I am prouder still to help tell his story. Ladies and gentlemen, the author of Naked in Da Nang, Mike Jackson. Well, thank you, I think. I don't know. Sometimes after she does that, I just feel like walking out. But uh, I'm here, and I'm here to stay. Madam Mayor and all distinguished uh, citizens of Frederick, it is early, but we're glad to be here. Um, I'm here today to tell you about a story, Naked in Da Nang. It's a story that's not a story that ends with the story. It's a story that begins another story. And the, the neat thing that we have done with Naked in Da Nang, the little book with a big echo, is we've started another story which is more important than the book. Now my uh, first words in the book are, mine is the story of a charmed life. And I really believe that. It's, it's a story of kind of stumbling through life blindly, and somehow it just all kind of works out. And, and that's the story of this book. It's a story of a small town guy that goes off to fight a war that uh, he wasn't really prepared to fight. And, uh, and it reflects a lot of what all of the Vietnam veterans Now, 
I need to explain to you a little bit about the title because everybody wants to know about the title. And the, and the title does, you know, in a, in a way it does create a little bit of a, a negative. We don't see that as a negative, we see it as a true story, but the title is Naked in Da Nang. And it didn't always start that way. It was supposed to be Naked uh, Came the Fact. And to explain that, I have to tell you what a fact is. A fact is a pilot in the Air Force that flies low, slow, and all day long out over the enemy, basically drawing fire. We, we trolled for uh, people to shoot us so we could find out where they were. And at that, well, it's a, it's a job. I mean, and, it, <laughs> and they paid us very little for that, but they gave us really cool flight suits. <laughs> if there had been any girls in Vietnam, we'd have been okay, but there was nobody there to impress. But uh, what had happened was, up until that point, the Air Force in the 50s and 60s, how many Air Force guys we got here? Remember the, the term all jet Air Force, Air Force girls, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a term all jet Air Force that they were talking about in the 50s and 60s. And they were going to put everybody in jets, because jets, jets really are sexy, girls like them. Uh, guys like that because girls like them and they joined the Air Force and that's, that's why they wanted to do it. That's not why they wanted to do it, but they wanted to go fast and they wanted to, you know, really be super cosmic and, and fly jets. Well, that's, that's all neat and good if you're just flying cargo or flying troops someplace. We ended up in a place called Vietnam where we were fighting a guerrilla war with guys on bicycles, guys walking through the jungle in, in ones and twos. And the neat thing about a jet is it goes really fast. The bad thing about a jet, it goes really fast, is that you can't see that little guy on the ground. You've got to slow down a lot to see that guy. Also in a jet, by the time you turn back around to see where he's at, you've made a 25-mile radius, and he's long gone. Jet also burns a lot of gas. Basically, think of it as a thing. You dump gas into a fire, and it shoots it out the back. So the time on target for a jet airplane was about, oh, a half hour maybe. Uh, by changing to the planes I flew, which were little, I don't know if you can see them over here, uh, little Cessna 337s, which they basically just went out to Cessna and said, give us the cheapest, slowest uh, thing you've got, uh, because <laughs> that's all Jackson deserves, you know? <laughs> and that's too good for him. So we ended up with a Cessna 337. They put four pallets of radios in it, and by and large, the airplane was cheaper than the radios. That's, that's how good this airplane was. And the neat thing about it is it could fly for five hours. And it could fly really slow, which is bad for the pilot. It could fly really low, which is also very bad for the pilot. But it was great for what we were doing of spotting targets and, and directing in airstrikes on them. The other thing we did was we were the guys that went out, and this was our finest hour, we separated the good guys from the bad guys in what's called a troops and contact situation and we are the ones that would surgically put in an airstrike to take out the bad guys and protect the good guys. And my claim to fame is that I think that I saved more people than I hurt in Vietnam. And by hurt, I mean the bad guys, and I hurt them pretty bad. But I saved more of our troops, and, I th and I'm very proud of that. But uh, you couldn't do that in a jet because you just can't fly that. It's not a case of having come home and been ignored. It's a case of having come home after a very difficult time, and those of you who have never been in combat, imagine for a minute living in fear and living under constant threat for 365 days, or 366 for Mike because of leap year, and all that you can think about during that time is coming home to a welcoming embrace and to the gratitude of a nation. What they came home to were protesters, taunts, and ignorance. And Mike tells the story of being told at Travis Air Force Base that maybe before he gets to San Francisco International, he might want to take off his uniform. Now, Mike doesn't operate that way, and Mike was tremendously proud of being in the United States Air Force. So he kept his uniform on, and he found out why he was advised to take it off, because they had protesters working in shifts at the airport. And sure enough, they met him, and they let him know what they thought of him. Uh, later on, he was advised that he might not want to put the Vietnam service on his resume because of the reputation that developed about Vietnam veterans. Now, during one of our speaking engagements, we met a two-star general who had a very successful career, a uh, very nice guy,
came up to us all choked up, even 35 years later, to tell us that as a young captain returning from Vietnam, he met his wife and his baby daughter at a Chicago airport, and all of them were spit on. So this is not a case of, of trying to correct something that was moderately done wrong. It's a case of trying to make something positive happen for a generation of young soldiers that needed this and didn't get it.